We're going to pick up this morning with Jude, verse 4. One chapter book, right before the book of Revelation. Uh, verse 4 is where we're at in our study. This book is about apostasy. It's about false teachers. <coughs> People that are in the church that teach bad things. It, that's what the book is about. That's what Jude's writing it about. And if you remember, last week I'm, I told you, he started off the book saying, I, I sat down to write this book about our common salvation. And he, evidently he was going to teach something about that. But the Holy Spirit interrupted him and said, no, you're not. We're going to talk about uh, these people that have come into the church that are threats to the church. So that's where I am this morning, verse 4. Jude says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there... There we have it. He points his finger. He's identifying uh, to his church folks that people have come in, right? Now, he says certain people. Certain people have crept in here unnoticed. And that's interesting. Uh, they were, number one would have to say they're members of the church. They were, they were insiders. They weren't out there on the street corner yelling at the church. They were in the church. And significantly, he says... They're in the church, but nobody notices them. And I find that to be highly interesting. Uh, I don't know what that says. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get to the bottom of it, but it really lets your mind run that someone who taught error could be active in a church and be unnoticed. And that, that saddens me. Uh, certain people have come in unnoticed. And you know, that's what makes them dangerous, does it not? Because nobody notices them. They're just one, one of us, one of the crowd, right? When, when uh, maybe you've been in a situation like this where someone's joined the church and uh, they begin to teach or talk or share like that, and you, you kind of, your antenna go up, you go, wait just a minute. That doesn't sound right. You know, I've had that happen to me. Uh, but, but these people, in Jude's case, they were, they were not even noticed. You know, they were there, and they were teaching things that were incorrect uh, and turning uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ into lewdness. So we'll go into that in great depth here in a minute. Uh, crept in is the word he uses. They've crept in. You kind of get the picture of a, a serpent or a lizard or, or something like that. A horny toad, uh, you TCU people. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's crept in to the church unnoticed by the, by the people of God uh, Dr. Robertson said the word is uh, to slip in secretly as if by a side door that's how they put him in uh, Charles Spurgeon said Satan knows right well that one devil in the church can do far more than a thousand devils outside the church Amen. right so that's what Jude's dealing with in his first century church in the year 68 A.D. They were unnoticed, he says in verse 1, by the church, but they were not unnoticed by God. And that's why we've got the book of Jude. God knew about it and called Jude to write this little book for us so that we can uh, have fair warning. You know, uh, when it says they were unnoticed by men, and we would... Conversely, say that means they were not unnoticed by God. Uh, it's, it's not like, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, the Lord is ever surprised at what goes on in churches. He's never caught by surprise by the good things nor the bad. He is sovereign. He knows everything. He knows everybody. He knows where we've come from. He knows what we think. He knows what we feel, and that's good, but it also applies to false teachers. When they come, they will not be unnoticed by God. He's going to know about it and act. Now, I want you to notice there in verse 1 something, talking about these false teachers. Look at it. He says, they were long ago 
Long ago they were marked for condemnation. Ungodly men, he says. Uh, that's striking because what he's teaching there is that a long time before these people even came to the church, God knew who, who they were and what they taught. And he's marked them. God's not passive, right? All right. God does not let error stand. He's marked them for condemnation. Uh, that should cause fear and trembling by anyone who trifles with God's word. But these men do trifle with it because it says they take the grace of God. <coughs> you know, it's the grace of God by which we're saved, right? Amen. It's by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves. Well, he says they take the grace of God and they turn it into lewdness, nastiness. They're seductors. Uh, they turn it into lewdness and then they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you might say, how's that possible? I mean, how could some teacher in the first century deny the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, uh, if you'll remember our study of 1 John that we just got through, that is precisely what was going on with the Gnostic teachers in the first century. They were denying the Lord Jesus Christ. They were denying that Jesus was the Christ. They had all sorts of theories that the Christ Spirit came on him at baptism, but, but it left him before the cross. Uh, they had all sorts of things to deny that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And I believe Jude has got some of them in his church as well. That's the same problem he's got. Marked out. Now, he calls the, before I go on to verse 10, I want you to notice in verse, or verse 5, rather, before I go to verse 5, notice in verse 4, he uses the phrase or description of these teachers as ungodly men. That's interesting. Ungodly men. I want you to remember that. Because Jude is going to use that description six times in these 25 verses to describe these false teachers. Uh, it's a very interesting description of someone that goes to church with you. Would you, would you agree? Uh, I come most Sundays, and I go to worship, and I go to Sunday school, and I can't remember ever calling anybody an ungodly person here. You know? And here he is. This is the severity, the gravity of what was going on in his church with false teachers. It's, uh, it's something that Jude is pointing out to us now. Uh, deny the, our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. That means, uh, that word deny, it's not complicated. It's not hard. <coughs> it means to renounce. You know what that is? To renounce the Lord Jesus Christ. These were people that had come into the Christian church for the purpose of renouncing the Lord Jesus as Lord. Yeah. Savior and Lord. That's why they were there. And he's calling them out. He's, he's, he's pointing at them. <coughs> now, verse 5. He says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now remember, he's talking to a first century Christian church. Probably the vast majority of the church members were Jewish. Uh, the Gentiles were going to come in later in time, uh, but early on in the 68 AD or so, it was mostly Jewish. And it was mostly in Israel, the church. It had not yet spread out everywhere through the Apostle Paul's efforts. And so he's saying to them, these Jewish people who have become Christians, he says, I want to remind you of something. Uh, you knew this before you became a Christian, right? You knew this when you were going to synagogue as a little girl, a little boy. You were taught that, that God came to Egypt and he, he sent Moses to deliver them and they all packed up their goods and they marched out and they got to the Red Sea, got part of the Red Sea, they went through it. And they marched on and had some things happen. And one day they got to Kadesh Barnea. I want you to be reminded of this because you used to know this. I shouldn't have to be telling you this again is what you'd say. What happened to Kadesh Barnea? That was where 
uh, Joshua and Caleb were sent in to spy out the land. Do you remember that? And they were gone a few days, and they came back with a cluster of grapes that it took two men to carry. And uh, But they said, the people there, they're bigger than these grapes. Yeah. They're like giants. <coughs> and they were. I'm going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> but, but the point is, because the people did not believe their report of Joshua and Caleb, God said, none of you people that came out of Egypt are going to enter the promised land. Amen. You're going to wander around the desert out here until every one of you have died, this generation. But these two, these two right here, they're going to go in. And sure enough, for 40 years they wandered, uh, should have been in the promised land and building their houses. But they wandered until those people gradually all passed away and their children grew up. And they're the ones that went in the promised land. We'll go back to verse 5. What's he say? I want to remind you, even though you used to know this, that the Lord one time before he saved all his people out of Egypt, but afterward he destroyed those who didn't believe him. Right? So that's what he's, he's calling attention to because you might think, I know you don't, but you might think, well, I know there's some people in our church that don't exactly have correct doctrine or they have some funny ideas and things like that, and it's not important. You know, we just love everybody and get along. Well, I'm for loving everybody, and I'm all for getting along with folks, but when there's, when there's false doctrine, when there's doctrine that counters the, the truth of the Word of God, we have to stand up and correct it. You can't let it go. And Jude's saying in verse 5, this is serious. Remember what God did to the children of Israel back there with Joshua and Caleb. So it's, it's important. Now, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians. It's not in Jude. 1 Corinthians 10 11. And it's one of my favorite verses of the New Testament. It says this. Now, all these things happened unto them for an example. All what things? He's talking about the Exodus, the Kadesh Barnea and all of that. He said, all of these things happened to them for an example. And they're written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. What does that mean? Well, it's very simple. It means when you open up your Bible and you read your Old Testament, understand that all of that took place in God's sovereignty as an example for you of what you're going to go through in your life. When we read the Old Testament, it's God getting his people ready, and he's teaching them things, and, and he's disciplining them, and he's doing many things, but it says they all, it all happened to them as an example to us, right? Don't say, I'm a New Testament person. I'm not Old Testament. I'm not going to read that. You need to read it. You need to know it good. Amen. The Old Testament's written for us. It's an example for us. And he says, it's written for our admonition because we're the ones upon whom the end of the world has come. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? We could be the last generation. It could be close when Christ comes back. He could come back today. Amen. The, the ones upon whom the ends of the world has come. We don't have time to dilly dally, you know. Uh, we need to read our Old Testament, learn from it. Okay, let's get back to Jude. <coughs> he subsequently destroyed those who did not believe in verse five. Now, destroy. Does that mean uh, physically? destroyed or does that mean spiritually destroyed? Uh, what's, he, what's the word mean? And we know what happened to all the folks back there in the Old Testament that had to wander in the desert and they died. It's, it was physical destruction. They were not, they were not uh, excommunicated from the Jewish community, right? They were found unfaithful and they were judged for it and they died physically. They were not lost. And Jude is writing to compare them to these people that are false teachers in the first century church and saying God has destroyed people physically before 
and you need to pay attention because he might be getting ready to do the same thing again. It could be coming now. Now, verse 6 gets to something very interesting. Verse 6. He says, <clears throat> The angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they left their own abode, or their home. <clears throat> he has reserved an everlasting chains under <clears throat> darkness for the judgment of the great day. Amen. Now, I could, I could spend several weeks on this verse. <laughs> this, this is important stuff. This is revelation from God. This is, uh, you know, we call the Bible God's Word. And that's no accident. It is the written down words from the mouth of God. Right? That's what we call it, God's Word. We believe it is infallible. It is without error. And it is complete authority to speak into our lives about everything. The Word of God. Now, when you read in the Old Testament, sometimes uh, you're going to read some things back then and have some questions. And you know what's interesting? Old Testament rocked on for centuries and centuries, and we get to the New Testament later, and lo and behold, it answers a lot of those questions for us. This is one of them. <coughs> He's talking about Genesis 6, verse 1 and following there, in, in verse 6. You know Genesis 6, right before Noah's flood, when it said that the uh, angels looked upon, uh, let me see, I think I heard it. <clears throat> let me read it for you. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born to them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Going on, it describes that the children born of this illicit union between angels and women produced giants. Yes. Uh, that's what Jude's talking about here. You know, you read that back there in Genesis 6, and it just, it just it's shocking, it's shocking. There's no other word for it. How can that be? But it doesn't have a lot of explanation back there in Genesis 6. It just states it matter of fact. It goes on. It describes Noah building an ark to get, get away. Well, I'm going to go into it a little bit. Uh, but notice it says in verse 6 a couple of things. Number one, these angels, they, they didn't keep their proper domain. Well, what is that? Well, it's very simple. They left heaven. They were created by God probably before the creation of Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, they were in heaven. They were his servants, his messengers. And verse 6 tells us they left that. Now we've, we've got other places we know of where Satan's fall from heaven is described for us. Isaiah 14 Ezekiel 28, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Uh, we've got many other references, but these angels, <coughs> these angels left their proper home, they left their own abode, their home, and came to the earth. And they committed such a sin on the earth that it says in verse 6, they have been reserved in everlasting chains. And, and the lights have been turned off. It's utter darkness where they are. Waiting for the judgment of the great day. You understand? Now God's done something very unique with these angels who sinned. We, we know there are other fallen angels, demons if you will, that harass us, they attack us, they, they tempt us as agents of Satan, they're running around loose in this world. Amen. And they cause havoc to people. But these committed a sin so heinous that God has locked them up already. <coughs> They've been locked up since Noah's flood. They've been locked up waiting for the great judgment of the great day. Right. When God's going to 
judge them completely, and they'll go into the lake of fire. Now, you might uh, want to walk with me just a minute. When I said it's angels, which angels, and how did I conclude that? Uh, <clears throat> the phrase, uh, you have to ask the question, which angels in the Old Testament rebelled and sinned? Uh, and so which ones are, is Jude talking about this morning? You know, because there's lots of stories in the Old Testament of angels. There are numerous accounts of them. Uh, in the Old Testament, you've got stories of angels who are behind, fallen angels, who are behind pagan worship. Paul calls them uh, demons. They're behind the idols and the statues that people build. Uh, you've even got some of them named, surprisingly. I didn't, wasn't aware of this until I studied this lesson. There's a demon angel in the Old Testament called Lilith, Isaiah 34, 14. Yes. Azazel in Leviticus 16a. There's goat demons in Leviticus 17 as well. These are fallen angels that are creating a false religion to deceive people and get them away from God, right? <clears throat> but Genesis 6, 1 and following, they are referred to there uh, in the King James as the sons of God. Sons of God. Now that expression, sons of God, it might, it might interest you to know. That appears four times in the Old Testament. That expression, sons of God. It always is referring to angels. Fallen angels. Uh, if you care to write it down, uh, I've got it here. I just lost it. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> that expression, sons of God, Genesis 1, uh, 6, 1, Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, Job 38, 7. Always referring to fallen angels, sons of God, who did not keep their own domain. Now, uh, many questions that I can't answer. It is clear from Genesis 6 that these angels... Uh, were able to have sexual relations with human beings. Uh, I remember talking with Dr. Huey about this years ago. Uh, his translation is heavenly beings, the sons of God. They were able to have sexual relations. They were even able to reproduce uh, a hybrid, if you will. Uh, uh, fallen. It's called in the, in the Hebrew in Genesis 6, fallen ones. They were giants. Some people say, oh, that's baloney. That couldn't have happened. Mm. Well, I think it did happen. They'll say to you, well, that's, and this is really a reach, but they'll say, well, that, those sons of God, that was uh, the favorite line of Seth. You know, me, it was Seth's line that took wives from those beautiful women and had children. Uh, well, the problem is, why would Seth's descendants having babies with uh, beautiful women produce giants? Why did that happen? Uh, you know, there's no explanation for that. But the scripture itself, sons of God, uh, in Genesis 6, does point to angels that did this. And I know it's, it's a stretch, and it's uh, shocking to many, but it's there. Uh, I don't think there's any argument about it. Uh, the point is, though, here's the main point. These angels left their, their proper domain, heaven, and they came and mixed uh, with people. And that was what was so wrong. And that was why, in their case, God took them, put them in everlasting chains in utter darkness, and they've been there ever since, waiting for the judgment of the great day. That day's coming, and they'll face it. <coughs> Jude goes on in verse 7, <coughs> talking about these angels. Uh, he says, those angels are as Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. and the cities around them, who in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, have gone after strange <coughs> flesh. Now that's Jude 7. Uh, I'm not ready for Jude 7, but I'm there. So I'm going to have to explain a little bit. 
There's people that will try to argue because they're so so shocked by the Bible teaching that those angels had sex that they'll try to come up with different things that they did that were wrong. That was just wrong, but not that. Well, Jude verse 7 goes on to identify the sin of these angels as being as the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, do you know? That's what it says. That's what I just read, didn't I? You got it there in front of you. What was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Homosexuality. Huh? Sexual immorality. Yeah, sexual immorality. Homosexuality, bestiality, many things. It was, that was what the problem was. That's why God destroyed <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, bad things happened in Sodom. You remember when the angels came to visit Lot? And uh, he had to pull them inside his house to protect them because the men of the town wanted them. Yeah. Remember that? Well, that echoes back to Genesis 6 and the same thing because Genesis 6 says the angels looked upon the women of the earth and they took, yeah. it was by force, they took them. It wasn't a, a friendly affair. It was a, it was a rape, if you will. They took them and had children by them. Bird Jude 7, just like Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, given themselves over to sexual immorality, and here it is. <coughs> this is it. They have gone after strange flesh. Now what's that? Well, think about it. Homosexuality, men going for men, women for women, is strange flesh. That was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was strange flesh in Genesis chapter 6? It was angels having sex with ladies. Strange flesh. Weren't supposed to be there. They left their own habitation, Jude says in verse 6. I uh, left heaven, came to earth, and did a very bad <coughs> sin. <coughs> now God has them in, in eternal bonds under darkness. Now, uh, we understand, as far as eschatology is concerned, that when Jesus comes back to earth, there will be a millennium, and then following the millennium, there will be what's called the great white throne judgment. That is when all the people will be judged, the lost. That's when Satan will be judged. That's when uh, the false prophet will be judged. And it, it, it very clearly describes it. It will be thrown into the lake of fire, uh, forever and ever and ever. And that's that's the ultimate destiny of these angels. Jude 6 and 7, he's saying God has them in a, <coughs> if you will, a temporary place. But he's, get, he's taking them out of circulation. <coughs> they are held in chains in darkness waiting for the great white throne. And then they're going to be thrown into the white of fire. So. Verse 7, let me read it again. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, have, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, very harsh. Very, very strong language to, to emphasize uh, the fact that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was infinitely serious to God. Such so that he destroyed their cities. Yes. I believe it was seven cities in all. <clears throat> and the people were judged immediately at that time. They were not given the rest of their lives to, to live in sin. They were taken out. They were judged at that time. Verse 7 also tells us their sin was going after strange flesh. <coughs> now, I know that uh, you live in 2018 in the country uh, with me, and we know what's going on around us. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, Macy's Parade, when two ladies mm -hmm. made a point of giving themselves a big kiss on national TV. Uh, we live in a nation that's legalized it as an alternative form of marriage. Uh, when I spoke earlier about the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, the reason I, 
I said that it was this. That it is the Word of God. And my understanding of it is that I am to read it and listen to what it says and hear it. And if my thinking doesn't agree with what that says, I need to change it. Yes. And if my my behavior that I'm doing, the things I'm doing in my life, they don't agree with that God's Word, I need to change it. Amen. And so, <clears throat> I just want to say that it doesn't matter what our culture says is right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Our culture someday is going to burn. Uh, our Lord is coming back to this earth. And when He comes back, He's going to make everything right. He's going to rule from His throne in Jerusalem. And every sin will be judged. And cultures will not exist like they do today. You need to be real careful to not be desensitized by our culture. And the only way you can do that is by being in the Word of God. And I, I, don't, I don't have one way. You can, you, can, you can open it up and read it. <coughs> you can listen to a cassette or a CD. You can, you can watch it on a DVD. I, there are many ways, but there is no shortcut for the Word of God in your life. It needs to be, it needs to take up minutes of your week, every week. Yes. I'm serious. Amen. Think about uh, your, your time with TV, with radio, and other forms of media. I'm not say anything good, bad, or ugly about that, but ask yourself the question, compared to them, how much time do you give to the Word of God? Written words from God Almighty in a book that you can carry with you anywhere you go. It changes us. It makes us strong. It helps us resist and fight this culture. It, it's a, a living word. It's quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Amen. We've got a word of God in written form. And uh, I believe that it's the answer for us to fight and, and, and represent Jesus in this generation that we're living in, this culture he's put us into. It's what you need in order to win. Uh, so cherish your Bibles. Cherish them. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, we got to verse 7. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to need to stop right now, but I think what we'll do is we'll pick up uh, probably the first week of January to complete Jude. We're just about halfway through it. So we'll have a couple more weeks of it after, after uh, the holiday. But the rest of our time till Christmas, I'm going to uh, be bringing some Bible studies from the Word of God about Christmas and what it means. So to be in the Spirit. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the Word of God. We thank you that you've seen fit to get a, a written word of uh, the exact representation of your will to us in the Bible. You've protected it. You've, uh, you've made it available to us. We've got it. It's in our homes. Father, I pray to ask you to open it up as we go to it. I pray that you would quicken our spirits and our souls and our minds. Help us to treasure the fact that we have uh, an avenue to hear from you directly through your word. Be with us this week, Lord, and for all our sick loved ones uh, and classmates here. Give them strength and healing. Uh, we pray, Father, uh, that you'll go with us now and keep us safe until we're together again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.